Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for this special edition. This is the Apraxia Awareness Day, super all-stars in my mind of Apraxia Therapy. Um, I'm sure you know these faces. They're all over social media, but we have Carrie Ebert, Jenny Biorum, and Amy Graham, and they're all joining us today to share their knowledge, their tips, their tricks to talk everything Apraxia. So I'm going to let them um, introduce themselves and talk a little bit also about the products that they offer. This isn't about selling stuff. This is about helping people. And their products really do help kids with apraxia. And um, I just really appreciate all the work that they put into it because trust me, the reason I don't have these products is because it's a lot of work <laughs> to do them. So um, I, it makes sense for me to go kind of in, in my little screen left and down. So I'm going to start with Carrie, go to Jenny and over to Amy. So Carrie, if you could get started. Hi, uh, so I am Carrie Ebert and my handle on social media is Carrie Ebert Seminars. Uh, my specialty area is working in early intervention with the birth to three population. So I am really focusing primarily on parent coaching, which is sometimes, I don't know, I think difficult when you think about apraxia and parent coaching, but that's really my forte. Uh, as far as products that I have, I have the book that Dave Hammer and I wrote. Uh, there's Dave. Yay, Dave. Um, uh, on apraxia, again, my specialty is when they're minimally verbal or even pre-verbal, we're just suspecting that there might be a motor speech, you know, component. Uh, Dave's area is more when they're more verbal, so older preschool uh, up through early elementary. So that is our treatment book. It's all on treatment. Uh, and then I have a few products. I have my Silly Sounds cards. I have four different sets of these, and these are just uh, sound effects. So designed to be held right next to the mouth as visual cues to draw attention to the movement of uh, the uh, you know um, speech sounds from consonants to vowels. So I have those, and I also have animal vowels, which really focuses primarily on uh, cleaning up those vowel sounds in kids who are verbal, but the vowels are distorted or in air. So um, again, held next to the face, not put on the table. They're really designed to be held here. So those are all focusing on vowel sounds. There aren't a lot of products that focus on vowel specifically. No, there um, aren't. Um, so those are, you know, the, the primary products. I also, uh, on Boom Learning, since we're in a quarantine and we're seeing kids virtually now, it's very hard to keep a, a 20 month old or a two year old engaged, uh, you know, on a screen. So the Boom cards at Boom Learning, uh, I have, um, I think I just counted, I'm up to 26 decks, I think, uh, now wow. I just try to create one a day, um, just to put out there for repetitive speech practice. So if we are doing wow, you know, every, every slide in the deck is wow, or, you know, if it's boo-boo, every slide is boo-boo. So we want to find a way to get parents to really embrace the strategy of uh, making something inherently not fun, fun, because repetitive <laughs> speech practice is boring. So I think that's something all of us are trying to do is how can we use principles of motor learning, get repetitive speech practice in a meaningful way, but in engaging and fun way. So the boom learning is um, my newest thing. So that's enough about me. Thank you, Carrie. Jenny? Thanks, Laura. I'm Jen Biorum. Um, my handle on Instagram and pretty much everything is Biorum Speech. I think the biggest question I get is how to pronounce my last name. <laughs> so <laughs> it's spelled B-J-O-R-E-M and it's Biorum, but if you mispronounce it, it's okay. I don't mind. <laughs> um, so I've got YouTube, I've got Facebook, I, my website is Biorum Speech and my Instagram is Biorum Speech. And um, so I specialize in childhood practice speech currently right now doing teletherapy. I'm seeing probably about 15 kids a week. Typically before that I was at about 24 sessions per week um, of hundred percent apraxia. I start right around 18 months of age going up to, I think my oldest on my caseloads around fifth grade. Um, so, you know, like Carrie, I do a lot of early intervention and then a lot of treatment into preschool and school age. Uh, I absolutely love childhood pregnancy speech. Probably my very favorite um, training was the Apraxia Kids Boot Camp for a week in Pittsburgh. I feel like that's kind of really what solidified my um, my learning and my confidence level for treating child apraxia speech, but probably the very first ever, uh, <laughs> love this, the first ever apraxia training I ever, ever did was in my living room with Carrie Ebert. So 
Um, I remember just, this story. That's right. I think Carrie or someone told me this at the conference. That is so crazy. And it's just such a fun because and you guys are in Colorado. We're in Kansas City. And um, so, you know, years and years and years ago, long time ago. A long time ago. Time ago. <laughs> wow. years ago, I called Carrie. I was like, I really don't know what I'm doing. Can you come over and teach me and all my therapists? And she did. She brought all of her stuff and did her spiel and now she's nationally known speaker in childhood apraxia speech, which is so cool. Um, I love that but story. I love that story too. It's so great. Um, <laughs> I always tell it when I'm presenting because I'm like, <laughs> right. Uh, so my products are Bjorn Speech Publications. My number one product that sells all day, every day are the Bjorn Speech Sound Cues. And they're just individual phonemes. So unlike Carrie's, which are like, um, she's working on movement strategies and like early environmental sounds is what we work on with kids at a very young age, pre-verbal, um, you know, suspected childhood apraxia speech. Mine are individual sound cues. So how these work is that once children identify them, uh, which they are um, a metaphor, so the popcorn sound is the sound. So I tried to make it sound like the each individual sound phoneme. You can put them together, make words. If you're working on wee with Carrie, you could even get the fish sound and the e sound and show the child the two sounds that make up Carrie's wee and put them together and show them, or that starts with your fish sound. Wah. So you, you can partner Carrie's product, my product with any program. So they're not a program. Yes. That's important. To, that's an important distinction. They're cues. Yeah. They're cues. Yeah. And that, I think that's really, really important is that when we are treating childhood apraxia speech, we're going to talk a ton about cues. Yes. Um, and I always have to remind people that I don't have a program. Yes. Carrie yes. doesn't have a program. We take a play-based, development appropriate, movement, research-based, principles, principles of motor, of motor learning. learning. <laughs> yes, yeah. principles of motor learning approach. So yeah. um, anyway, I love what I do and I love teaching others and I love empowering um, speech pathologists and parents. Um, and that's, you know, that's my goal. So thanks for having me. And you just, I, you have, you, you've been killing it on the boom cards too, right? Yeah, I forgot. I've been making a ton of boom cards. Yeah. Mostly like early intervention, like late two, three, four, five, preschool age. So um, I've got a couple repetitive ones like Carrie's done. I've got like eat and up and down and go. Uh, but then I've got a lot of interactive ones and some older language ones as well, uh, where I've even put in the speech sound cues to form that word in my, in my uh, boom card. So yeah, boom's been a lot of fun. It's kind of my creative outlet. So <laughs> it's too. my therapy. <laughs> okay. Well, that explains how you're doing so well with it because um, <laughs> I'm not, um, but I'm consuming. So that matters. Um, <laughs> Amy. Yeah. These girls on the bottom of the screen down here are the product rock stars and I use all their <laughs> stuff. I love their stuff. <laughs> so I'm Amy Graham. Um, I am a private practice owner in Colorado Springs and I specialize only in speech sound disorders. So that's who I see at my practice. I've been doing that for years. Um, and the products that I have been creating, and really it's not that many <laughs> because I'm not as creative as these two <laughs> girls down here, but it, there are things that I knew that I knew I needed for my own personal practice. And so um, I think differential diagnosis is a big aspect of childhood apraxia of speech. <laughs> so the, the, what I saw, the whole, the gap that I saw missing in so many assessments that I was looking at from other from other SLPs was the oral mech piece and that we can actually glean so much information from that and it was missing so often because I don't think it's taught very well sadly mm -hmm. at some of these grad schools and then I don't feel like so many SLPs what I've heard from them is they're just, they don't feel confident in knowing what to look for, how to look for it, and then how to interpret those results. So um, what I developed was an oral facial exam, and it's basically three pages of an easy checklist. Do you see this? Yes or no? And kind of helps you walk through each of those steps. And I, I, um, it's a downloadable PDF that I sell on my website. This is the first page, and I, it's got some diagrams um, to help you kind of look at tonsil size, look at the jaw, the lips, the mouth. I mean, everything that we really should be looking at with any child 
um, if at all possible, that has a suspected speech sound disorder, apraxia or not, even if it's phonology or a single sound errored kid. Um, and so that's my specialty is all speech sound disorders and you know, childhood apraxia of speech is a neurologically based speech sound disorder. So that falls under that umbrella. And so that's what I specialize in. And um, my other products that I sell on my website and TPT are basically um, a case history form specific to speech sound disorders, especially um, to help you SLPs glean information from parents um, about some of those early red flags that we're beginning to find out um, from some of the newer research about things that can help us, you know, maybe clue into whether or not this child is at risk or has suspected childhood apraxia so that we can treat more effectively and more appropriately earlier. Um, because we know, and all these experts on this panel, we know it is a very different way to treat childhood apraxia of speech than other speech sound disorders. Like what Carrie and Jenny were saying, we have to be using principles of motor learning and we need to be using interventions that aren't just what we think of as traditional RTIC interventions or phonological interventions. We have to be utilizing these principles of motor learning and other uh, methods like, and I know we'll talk about this later um, in a little bit because you've got some questions for us. Um, but I also, one of my specialties is working on, um, working with kids who have those residual articulation disorders because with childhood apraxia of speech, that's a, that can be a really big issue. Um, and so actually I worked with Jenny um, and I developed this, Bjorn, Yay. it's, can you see that Bjorn speech sound cue specific <laughs> to lateral lisps. So lateral lisps are one of I mean, I think nothing strikes more fear in the hearts of SLPs <laughs> than working on a lateral lisp. And so it's one of the things that I actually love. And uh, my sister, I, I actually got into this whole field because my sister had a residual speech sound error that um, after years of therapy, just she could not get it corrected. And so when I was in grad school, she was still in college. She asked me to help her. Oh, and wow. I think in about 10 minutes, we help, I helped her correct her lateral lisp. And so I felt like I just, I kind of had um, a, a little, you know, uh, idea in my head about how I could help um, anybody correct a lateral lisp. And so that was kind of the idea behind um, these cards here. So I'm, I have not gotten into the boom learning game yet. I'm playing around with it. So um, that, those might come soon. So keep an eye out for those. Um, and those, most of my, uh, my, you know, probably boom cards or what I have on TPT will be specific to those residual articulation errors um, that um, a lot of our kids are dealing with. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I am Laura Smith and I specialize in childhood apraxia speech. Usually I take kids around two um, and I see them all the way. I, I mean, I have the oldest one is 18, but I would say the primary, the majority of my caseload are all motor speech for the most part. I make exceptions if there's a sibling and um, I, the majority of them are, you know, like toddler elementary age. So definitely utilize a lot of the products that um, I have these wonderful ladies on here telling you about, which is why I wanted them to tell you all about it because um, childhood apraxia speech, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of treatment approaches out there that aren't necessarily evidence-based and um, everyone on this panel just mentioned principles of motor learning and we're going to keep mentioning it. It's, uh, it would, we could do a whole course, all of us, or a whole conference on it. So, you know, um, Google Scholar it, Edwin Moss. What's the newest one we just had, Amy, when we were doing our talk? It was Edwin, I, right? I feel like Edwin Moss has been what, who's ha been having the most current literature that's coming out. Yeah. So um, SLPs watching this, if you want to know what are they talking about principles of motor learning, look that up. Um, I've written a book called Overcoming Apraxia. I told everyone else to have their products with them and I had to move to my basement and now I don't have anything. But anyway, I have a book out there and it narrates the story of my daughter who has apraxia and overcoming apraxia as well as um, uh, uh, I tried to pack it full of like resources for SLPs and parents. So um, yeah. Oh, Jenny, oh, you're I was so say, sweet. I have it right here, too. <laughs> Mine's oh. over there. Yeah, there's mine. I just saw it. <laughs> oh, that's what you guys were looking for. I'm, yes. like, I I'm like, like, right there. But like I saw Jenny getting it. are looking the same way. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thank you. Yes. So it was a labor of love for sure. And um, I, I did it, though, for, to, for resources for parents and professionals. So, um, okay. So we're going to get kind of started with... Um, just, you know, Amy, that was a great segment into assessment. I think that a lot of, I, I don't know about you guys, but I get a lot of questions from SLPs asking, 
I don't, I don't know where to start. And there isn't one test, unfortunately, that we can all tell you to go to that's going to diagnose childhood apraxia speech. It doesn't work that way. It works that way through um, a motor speech exam, a dynamic motor speech exam. So, um, and like Amy was just talking about those red flags that, um, you know, a case history, solid case history is really important too. So um, Carrie, I think I might start with you because um, you, you had uh, posted all those, I just actually sent those to someone, those nice graphics about the new research for the red flags in childhood, or I mean, sorry, in infancy. Um, mm -hmm. Could you speak to, the, to that? Yeah, so it's research uh, that has recently been published um, by Dr. Overby and colleagues uh, about tentative guidelines for diagnosing uh, apraxia in toddlers as young as age two. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions out there that you can't diagnose CAS until three. I don't know where we get this from. There is nothing, you know, I've had parents say to me, oh, well, next month he's going to get a diagnosis because <laughs> he turns three next month. So, I mean, there's no magic age. Mm -hmm. There are some five-year-olds who do not have enough verbal imitation skills to be able to do a dynamic yes. motor speech assessment. So we've got to stop. I think that's the biggest myth that I wish when it comes to assessment. If, if the people watching get nothing else out of this, there is no age at which you can diagnose CAS, okay? It's not about age. And so, uh, but we have enough guidelines now based on this awesome research that is showing. And this is, this is why we have got to be listening to parents when they say something's not right, you know, and pediatricians yeah. love the let's just wait and see approach. Yeah. So my new favorite hashtag is hashtag let's just see, which just simply <laughs> yeah. means when a parent is concerned, refer to the expert, which is the SLP, right? And let us determine whether we should wait and see because only the SLP can determine whether we're looking at a delay, a child who is acquiring all the milestones in the correct sequence but is behind schedule, or whether we're looking at a disorder, which means the child is missing milestones, skipping them all together, has scattered skills, whatever words you wanna use there. Uh, kids with a disorder need intervention immediately. We don't wait and see for anything. And so um, it's really important to know how many consonant sounds are in the child's uh, vocabulary. That is basically what that research by Dr. Overby is showing, is that if children don't have any consonants by a age 12 months. That's a red flag. If they only have, and I don't have the research in front of me. I forgot to grab it. Do you have it? Yeah. Um, do you want me to read through them real if quick? If you could, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. It's first consonants after 12 months, three or fewer consonants by 16 months, five or fewer consonants between 17 and 24 months, lack of velars or posterior sounds in the first 24 months, dependency on bilabials, alveolars, stops, and nasals in the first 24 months, and limited syllable structure. So, so fascinating. We, we know the most common syllable structure for these very young kiddos is V or CV, mm -hmm. right? So they're not, we're not seeing CVC, we're not seeing reduplicated CVCV. So we've got to be looking at early speech. And I'm telling you, living in the digital age is such a blessing because when I call to schedule an evaluation, I ask parents, I say, please dig up videos from when your child was three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, and 15 months old. I want to hear them because parents are very poor reporters, okay? They don't know the difference between voice sounds, voiceless sounds, syllable structures. You know, they don't understand what velars and alveolars are. So I just want video. And the way I document it in a report is information was obtained via parent report, you know, maybe medical records if you have those, and retrospective video analysis. That's a really fancy way of saying that we got the information from videos parents provided. It's called retrospective video analysis, and it should be a part of our evaluations, especially in early intervention, to determine are we looking at delay or disorder, right? Are we looking at possible motor speech issues? So That's I'm very great. excited. I do totally um, informal assessment um, uh, with these very young children, infants and toddlers. Um, the DEMS is for starting at age three. I use the principles of DEMS, you know, of that evaluation. Um, certainly, I'm looking at the queuing hierarchy and all of that. Uh, but everything that I do is really informal uh, assessment. Um, and in my uh, course that I do, I have a whole section on assessment looking at uh, those uh, red flags, you know, that are pretty consistent with atypical acquisition of speech. So, well, and I, do you think, I think that's a common misnomer too among SLPs is that we need a standardized assessment in order to 
diagnose childhood apraxia of speech. Even Dr. Dr. Strand, who wrote oh, the DEMS, yeah. said that the, the DEMS alone will not give you a diagnosis, right? Uh, to me, CAS is more a description of the speech sound disorder instead of, I mean, I know we call it a diagnosis, but it, it's descriptive. It tells us what kind of treatment to provide. And so if you even suspect SCAS, right, is the big thing that I use, mm -hmm. suspected childhood apraxia of speech, um, I'm just going to throw this out there. And I know, because I know we're limited on time, but, um, and then I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> Uh, but for treatment, uh, use principles of motor learning. Because I'm telling you right now, it's not going to do any harm if the child doesn't have a apraxia. Yes. But if you don't use principles of motor learning, if you use a play-based um, language stimulation approach and focus on self-talk and parallel talk and sentence expansion, children with CAS will make this much progress. This much. Zero. Okay. And that's why most of the kids that get referred to me have already been in speech therapy for a year, in early intervention, have made no progress. So we had a gap like this. Here's receptive language. Here's expressive speech, right? And, and what happens is the gap just gets bigger and bigger and bigger because nobody's focusing on motor learning. And right. so they just keep working on play and receptive language because, oh, the kid makes progress with that. And this is why parents pull their hair out, SLPs pull their hair out, and that's why then they have to go to a specialist like yeah. you know, one of us. And, th and those are the kids that get referred to us. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, 100%. And I can say from my own personal experience just with Ashlyn, you, I, I like to tell everyone, between the ages of two and three, my daughter was primarily pre-verbal. And I worked with her every single night. I'm an SLP. I'd been an SLP. I'd work with her every single night between two years and two eleven. And mm -hmm. just like Carrie said, I would say the progress she made was mm -hmm. this. Nominal. Yeah. Yeah. And then I finally took her to someone who understood principles of motor learning, literally started making progress in one month. Yep. I was like, well, I can make progress in one session. And that's, yeah, I just yeah. did a consult with a little girl that's been in therapy for like six months. And I mean, the mom was in tears because in yeah. one session I am pulling sounds out of her. She's, she's moving between consonants and vowels. And the mom was like, I don't understand. Can you come every week? I'm like, sorry, you already have a therapist who comes every week. I can serve as a con, you know, it's, it's so frustrating for everybody. So, and I think that's another misnomer too, is that yes, progress is going to be slower with children who have CAS, but that doesn't mean it's non-existent. Yeah. I hate that one. Every I make progress. Lesson. I know Jenny does. I know Amy does. We make progress every single session. Every, every session. I would never allow for them to not make progress. Like it's not an option. Okay, you adjust your cueing so the child does right. make progress. Mm -hmm. Or you simply or you simplify the target or you exactly. adjust the cueing and you meet somewhere. But if you're not making some if you're not making progress, you're right. In one in, in one session, session, you need to change your approach. And you need yeah. to change something up. Mm -hmm. You need to change your approach or you need to ethically research and talk to somebody who knows what they're doing so that you are informed and you're not wasting time for this child. That is an ethical dilemma, definitely. It, it is definitely I, an I ethical I don't know about you, you ladies, but I offer consults to SLPs too, like video oh, consults. Absolutely. If, you, if you don't know, if you, if you have a specific right. case, because I get a lot of questions and emails that I can't always, you know, provide right. a, a whole lot of information for people yeah. and spend a lot of time on, but we provide consultations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's part of our learning. It's, it, you know, it's what we've all had to do to get where we are. I mean, yeah. I paid Carrie to come to my house yes. to teach us on apraxia. It's exactly what I did. Well, yeah, if I um, want to become an expert in stuttering, I'm going to have to go to SLP, Steve, Stephen right. SLP or somebody <laughs> to teach me. Like I'm not, you know, I specialize. And so I'm really good at one thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But I'm not great at everything as an SLP. And I almost think we need extra initials. Now I'm getting off topic here. But <laughs> it shows what our specialty is, you know, because there's no way you can be a swallowing expert and an apraxia expert and a stuttering expert. It can't, you can't. It's not Especially possible. when you delve into a specialty area like we have. Mm -hmm. I think I attended boot camp too, like um, Jenny did, but um, also, you know, done other trainings like DTTC. And once you even, like, once you think you know, because the, the criteria to get into boot camp was you had to at least have some working framework of apraxia sure. and prove that you did. So then once you got in there, it was knowing that I actually, just all the stuff that I, like you said, it kind of connected the dots, Jenny, and it solidified your knowledge. And when you specialize, that's what you see. And I think the one thing that scares me the most is when I get clients referred to me and the SLP thought they knew. I was telling them before we started this Zoom. And that's scarier than the SLP that just says, hey, you know what? I don't specialize in this. I'm going to go seek out some additional knowledge and make sure I'm doing the very mm -hmm. best I can for this child. So yeah, for sure. Um, Jenny, can you speak to, um, I get questions on assessment for, you know, um, on assessment. Oh my goodness. It says it's going to end in 10 minutes. How did we talk this long, you guys? Um, <laughs> <We're> <laughs> verbose, sorry. 
Um, can you talk about, like, I, I send people to your informal um, uh, uh, motor speech exam that you have on TPT. Um, is there is there something you want to speak to, like the new SLP that's like, I don't know what I'm doing. What am I looking for? Actually, all of you, if all of you could speak to that. What am I looking for to um, rule, like to see if it's apraxia versus a phono? I think the difference, um, well, I know the difference is um, it, therapists have to understand the difference between a dynamic and a static assessment. So a static assessment is going to be like a golden fristo where we assess um, a word looking for their errors and we write down their errors and we're like, okay, they um, left off the final sound or left off the beginning sound. In uh, With a dynamic assessment, we're looking for um, multiple repetitions. And our goal as the assessor is for the child to get the target word correct. Um, so we are going to assess that child over and over again um, with those targets to find out what cueing it takes, what kind of, if, if their errors are consistent, we're listening for vowel distortions, we're listening for, um, I'm sorry, I said inconsistent errors, we're listening for any type, all the 11 signs, and that's in my, my, um, my evaluation report. So it's the Mayo 10, but we've kind of added an 11th one. We're looking for all of those signs across speech tests. So you can't just give a Goldman Fristo and diagnose a kid with child apraxia speech. Okay. You need to do a speech sample or a, a language sample with a speech sample. You need to do a Goldman Fristo in a dynamic way. You need to assess several different syllable structures. And we're looking for consistent errors across multiple speech tasks. So each one of those may be a speech task, but we're looking for the child to have, let's say, vowel distortions across, you know, three or four speech tasks. We're looking for them to have um, inconsistent errors up, up, across three or four speech tasks. We're looking for them to have an intrusive schwa or groping across three or four speech tasks. So that's why, as Carrie said before, you may have a five-year-old that we can't diagnose with child apraxia speech because they don't have enough speech. Right. They have to have enough speech to show you these errors. If they don't, it's probably going to be a, C, or a suspected CIS at that point. Or it, like Carrie said, you can approach, you can take this treatment approach for kids with child apraxia speech. And whether they have child apraxia speech or not, they're going to make progress. Yes, exactly. So, you know, it's better to take the, this motor-based planning speech approach if you suspect it then not because right. kids across the board are going to make progress but um i think you just have to really get in i think you know i have on my evaluation i have a list of all the things we're looking for and i have specific descriptions of it's what so those good. mean because many people may not know what an intrusive schwa is and many people know, may not know what initial articulatory configuration and difficulty with initial articulatory configuration looks like what does that look like i don't understand what that means that's a good point most people aren't taught this in grad school mm -hmm. um and it's unless you really specialize not. just to practice speech you're probably not going to know and I just want to say too, like you can use the the tools that you have. You can use a Goldman Fristo, like you said, in a dynamic way. Yes, but really? be careful too with those tests because so many times they're very um, they're they're not as complex syllable shapes. So sometimes yeah. you might have a child that once you get into those multisyllabic words and you kind of tax their motor speech system, that's when things start to show up. And I've had kids like that where parents have come to me, they've had, they think it's maybe a language based issue because they can't put these sentences together right. They don't sound right, um, but they did a Goldman Fristo and they passed. At the yep. so, word level, they're fine. At the single word level, right. So right. we need to right. tax their system a little bit right. more, go to those longer words, look at phrasing right. and that kind of thing and, and their prosody as well. One thing I, I want to say- I get question is, a lot. I, I'm sorry, Carrie. I, oh, no. Go I'm, ahead. I'm sorry. I get that question a lot. It's like, hey, you know, can somebody with childhood apraxia speech be fully cured? And this was like a, a conversation we had at our boot camp. Can they? Because if we took and really taxed their system, like really, really, you know, they've had years and years and years of therapy, but we gave them a tongue twister from, you know, and really taxed their system. We may see, we may push and be able to see some of those motor planning issues that are kind of still there. Um, oh my God, I have to tell you something, Jenny. I just got a, a video. It was a kid I saw when he was two, suspected CAS. He's now 14. Mom took a video. He was trying to say a new phrase. He was being silly and he was trying to say bon appetit. 
and he could, the groping, he couldn't get it out. Oh. He kept saying, she sent me the video and he's fully intelligible. He hasn't wow. been in speech therapy for years, taxed his motor planning system with a new phrase that he's never used, um, you know, before. And he was like laughing because he couldn't get it out. He's like, what's wrong with my mouth? Papa bona tea, tea da bona. I mean, it was like doing potica with bon appetit and it took him like five tries to get it. So, you know, I'm adding that to my seminar now. And I'm glad you said that. My mind. The potica thing. I think we as SLPs forget that. And I'm going to go back to the, um, my the oral mech exam too guys yes, include yeah. that please yeah. include it and i forgot to mention this i know we just have a second but if you have trouble getting oral mech exam please use a throat scope this Absolutely. thing is yeah. amazing if you girls don't have one of these things they're like yeah. little fairy ones and um the oral mech exam actually is sold in a bundle on the throat scope website so please it's, it's all it should be a part of your differential diagnosis Absolutely. Real quick though, if you're given the Goldman Fristo, what I'm just going to ask every SLP to do is please have them say every word three times. Because yes. at least then what you're going to do, you can turn any Arctic test into a mini mm -hmm. um, motor planning test just by having yep. him say every word three times. Because if a kid <clears throat> with an articulation disorder says fish and he says bish, he's going to say bish, bish, bish. bish. He's going to say it the exact same way three times in a row. But if he has CAS, he's going to call it a bish and then a shif and then a fib, and he's gonna say it differently. And it's gonna give the SLP immediate information that says this is not articulation. So but you're please. not gonna know that unless you do that. I don't even score it. I know. I can't do it. Score right, right. <laughs> not with a kid with CS. You can't even score the Goldman Fristo. No, it's, it's worthless, but. It's yeah. worthless. It's information for you right. to use with your clinician brain. We are not technicians. I had somebody, I got to say this really quickly. I had somebody give me like a three-star review on what, on my target, <laughs> um, target, uh, like helping target selection on TPT. She's like, I wanted you to tell me what targets to, I, I needed examples of targets. And so I went in and I'm like, that's your job. That's your that job. Is, you are a clinic. And is this the is the child's phonemic right. repertoire. Yeah. You are a clinician, not a technician. And you know what? I always tell my twin a story. My kid that came to me and they were working on his previous speech therapist was working on tuna. And I said to his mom, I said, why tuna? Is his dog named tuna? Does he eat tuna? Does he love tuna? He can't say mama, dada, hi, or bye. And they're working on tuna. Functional. And so we need functional. Yes. So, so, so that was my thing with her. I was like, I'm not going to give you the answers. You are not a technician. You are a clinician. This is, I'm giving you the guide. You need to get all the sounds in the child's repertoire. You need to interview the parents and find out what words of importance, what words does the child already have in their repertoire? You know, if they've got the word knee and they have a bunny at home, that's their pet, or the dog's name is bunny. Well, guess what? We're going to, and they've got ba and a. Uh, in their vocabulary, then bunny is going to be an important word to this kid, but maybe not the next door neighbor. Right. Exactly. Yep. So that's, that's, I'll step off my soapbox now, but <laughs> give you those answers. Um, we have to go, unfortunately. Um, if you are interested in learning anything else, I did want to mention Apraxia Awareness Day is May 14th. That's when this video will come out. Um, all the providers on this Zoom will have access to it and can share it um, via their social media outlets should they choose to. Please feel free to reach out to any of them. As uh, Carrie has said, she's Carrie Ebert Seminars. She has seminars. Um, every, they all have products. So um, if you have any more questions, um, feel free to reach out to them. So thanks for having us. So much. Thank you. Thank you.